Yes, I was given the crystal ball job of what's down the pipeline and what can we expect next. And I'd like to focus on that next word rather than too far over the horizon. These are my disclosures, which as usual aren't up long enough for you to read. And this is the plan of campaign to focus really on type 2 diabetes. A quick look at where we are now. Um, with an election coming up, we've had so many facts and figures, I thought I'd just throw a few more in. Uh, the pathogenic elements that we're trying to combat. How about putting a few things that we've got already together? Then what are the novel injectables and the novel oral agents we can expect to see? So where are we now? This is the number of prescriptions for treating diabetes. Insulin's in the blue. Here's the other anti-diabetic drugs, and here's the glucose monitoring. And you can see the insulins and glucose monitoring just gently going up. But you can see here a massive number on the uh, prescriptions of other agents. And if we look at the cost of this, and um, we go from 2008 again up to 2019, right up to date, we can see that there's been a tipping point. And that tipping point was five years ago when the other than insulin glucose lowering drugs have now gone way above the costs of the insulin uh, and of course the glucose monitoring. And the, if you lump these all together, which Quoth does, it comes to over a billion pounds. And that's just England. That doesn't include Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, or the prescriptions in secondary care. OK, so you're responsible for a billion. Um, let's just look at that in terms of what it actually is to the NHS as well. Because if the NHS um, direct costs are somewhere around about 135, 140 billion, um, diabetes is believed to be worth around about 14 billion now, which amazes me. And if you look at the breakdown of that, then the majority of it is for treating the complications, the, particularly the hospitalization element. But that um, billion or so um, is in fact just 7.8% of the cost of diabetes. So actually treating, keeping the glucoses under control is a very small proportion. And you can see here where the complications breakdown is. I just threw it in for good measure. But we should also remember that the indirect costs, and these are the direct costs, the indirect costs already add up to more than the direct costs. So. Very interesting facts and figures. Let's have a look at the pathogenesis now to make sure we're comfortable about what we're treating. So I'm focused this afternoon on glycemic control. And we know that all of these tissues are involved and all of these little problems um, arise in the control of blood glucose. And all of these defects are apparent and they're different defects in different tissues to different extents. And we've got all of these different therapeutic approaches. We say, right, lifestyle first, then if we're going to set about trying to counter insulin resistance, it's going to be metformin, uh, maybe we'll stimulate insulin secretion here, maybe we'll deal with one of the incretin systems here, uh, maybe we'll use one of these. We could even, of course, and we'll be focusing on those. And eventually, we'll turn to this at the bottom. So we already have a mass of agents which are acting in different ways, and uh, we need them. And the evidence why we need them is very much because of the progressive nature of type 2 diabetes. And I've just picked two that you're all very familiar with, the UK PDS and ADOPT, which shows with one agent you get this constant progression. And if we look at the UK PDS data, uh, because uh, it was able to run on one agent for much longer than you'd be able to do now, 
we can see that by the time you get to nine years through, then we are dealing with one agent rarely being able to achieve 25% of patients with a reasonably good control, which means that 75% of patients would be appropriate by this time for combination therapy, which leads me very comfortably to combination therapy. And if we go and have a look at the American guidelines, they've grasped this nettle um, pretty rigorously. In fact, they've actually said, if you've got an A1C above uh, 7.5, so we're dealing here in the sort of 60 millimole bracket in new money, then you'll have started with lifestyle and metformin, but you might as well go straight away to adding something else as well, dual therapy, and this is their checklist of their preferred sequence order. And they've even jumped to the point of saying, right, if you've got that much higher, we're talking 9% now, so we're well up the millimole uh, per mole scale, but you might even consider triple therapy as a starter. So we're all agreed that good glycemic control from day one is crucial in being able to prevent or reduce a certainly microvascular complications. So why wouldn't you do this? Well, um, a lot of people worry about starting too many things too quickly. But of course, there are several advantages of looking at dual combination therapy. And I've listed the combination therapy advantages and disadvantages in this column and compared them against just one agent. So if you had two agents, you can usually use lower doses. If you use lower doses, then you're going to get fewer side effects. Um, there's also evidence that you can get greater efficacy, of course, with two agents and longer durability. And by having two agents there, you're able to hit a wider range of effects, so you're able to address more pathogenic factors. And this, of course, enables you also to be able to use agents in individuals with comorbidities if you're going to be able to get away with the lower doses bearing in mind those renal problems. You see, I thought I'd get that one in so that we can have a quid pro quo there. There are, of course, one or two cautions that uh, we might bear in mind that have been raised. And I've seen this one in the literature, but I'm never really sure whether or not there is any evidence to support this. But if you look at those fixed dose combinations, there is certainly a convenience factor there, and there are lots of different tablet strengths um, this may well be improved, and of course, you do often get the metformin for free. This is what we've got approved in Europe, and the blue ones here are the ones we've got in the UK. So there are plenty of options for this. It is a growing element, so this is something that I think is in our going to come um, more popular as time goes on. Now, you might think that triple therapy is a bit um, of a long shot in terms of early in treatment, and usually it's something you eventually get to as the condition has advanced very considerably. But here we can see triple oral of metformin, an SGLT2 inhibitor, and a DPP4 inhibitor. And we can see if you take the SGLT2 and the metformin, it comes out in the middle there, it does better than the DPP4 and the metformin. But if you've got the metformin, the DPP4, and the SGLT2 in the red here, you can see much improved A1C. You can also achieve the same sort of drop in body weight as you get with the SGLT2 and the metformin together. And you've also got a reasonable benefit here because the SGLT2 is there to help um, in the control of blood pressure. Now, this looked like an interesting exercise as far as putting three things together, but it's quite interesting to note that now we have the triple tablet, and we actually have uh, the FDA's approved this. And just uh, a week or so ago, um, this became possible in the European uh, environment as well. So this tablet 
What do we know about it? Well, if you look at the reduction in A1C at 24 weeks, and we go to the higher dose here of uh, 10 milligrams of DAPA, 5 milligrams SAXA, and then there was 1,000 of uh, slow-release metformin, we can see here a quite considerable reduction in A1C. So the concept is being taken forward from a fixed-dose dual to a fixed-dose triple. And if you um, look now at the possibility of how does this pan out with durability, well, we have some evidence here from a study that Ralph de Fronzo started many years ago in San Antonio, in which he looked at uh, patients at diagnosis receiving metformin, pioglitazone, and exenatide. Okay? And he was able to show that you could get to A1C target pretty quickly and maintain it. And we've got that over one, two, three, four, five, six years now that they're able to obtain a 6% A1C much better than individuals who were started off on metformin, then there was addition of a sulfonyl urea, and he eventually, of course, may have to go to insulin. So triple therapy and durability, the important thing. We've heard earlier in this um, wonderful conference about the importance of timing and the windows at which we can actually make good uh, benefit um, in the short term for the long term. And here we can see an example of that again, coming down to 6% A1C. And also, in this study, we don't have the final data here yet, but we can see out to three years, there was good control of the weight. That now takes us to um, what do we think will be the next novelties for injectables. And I'd just like to give us a quick trip through the terminology here. First of all, mixtures. So we can now have two peptides, for example, in a single injection. And we already have this, for example, with Ideglyra and Iglalixi, where we've got insulin and a GLP-1 together. So that's combination. But we've also got the possibility to be able to fuse two um, peptides together. And so it would look like one peptide. They're in the same syringe. They might be joined together, for example, with an amino acid linker of various sorts. Um, sometimes they're completely fused together. And then we've got chimeras, which is where the active epitopes might be jumbled up. And to some extent, there's um, an area in between here where you've got bits of these, but they're not actually totally jumbled up. And I've therefore... Um, cheated really and called them designer peptides. I think that probably gives us um, a better feel for them. Uh, we can of course join lots and lots of them together so that would be our polymer and of course we often want to delay the period of time that uh, they're in the circulation before they are broken down so we're able to join them to um, for example large proteins and we do this already with um, Lixi and uh, semaglutide and degladec and we can see here the typical linker that is used to uh, get us from lysine through glutamate to a uh, fatty acid here and we've also got the option as uh, we can see here to join our peptide or, or indeed a string of peptide to uh, gamma globulin to the FC uh, fragment so that would be another way. And another way that we have to consider is to add to polyethylene glycol in order, again, to slow down the rate of degradation. Um, we're going to have a look at several examples of all of these. But the, the first one to bear in mind that's on the horizon is um, this additional uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, which... Miles had already uh, mentioned, which will be linked to um, an, a gamma globulin. And the plan here, as far as I can see, is um, to 
have studies for one-week injections, but they've already looked at once-monthly injections. So I think that's an interesting possibility for the future. Now, let's have a look at some of those designer peptides and see where we are. So our first one is a dual agonist at the GYP receptor and the GLP-1 receptor. So if you like, it's like our existing GLP-1 receptor agonists with a GYP receptor agonist thrown into the peptide. Here it is, dizepatide. And if we look at the change in A1C here over a period of six months, what we're seeing here in the red is dulaglutide at the upper dose of 1.5 milligrams on a once weekly. And we can see here our uh, dual agonist peptide and by having those two together and I know the doses are higher here but you can see the dose related effect and a fairly extensive 2.4 percent reduction in A1C so very interesting indeed and if you look across here at the weight there's the weight reduction uh, pretty uh, and well um, shown in several other studies we can, uh, with dulaglutide, we can see a very extensive, with the high dose up here, a very extensive weight reduction. If you want to look at the structures of any of these peptides, I've listed them down here. So you can see the GLP-1, you can see the GYP, and you can see that this is very, very close to um, GYP at this end, and if you like, GLP-1 or at least exenatide at the other end. So that's how it's been put together. There is a price to pay, of course, for that extensive reduction in A1C and weight. It's here, and we can see that it is the GI side effects. But if you come down a notch in dose, you can begin to see that you can indeed get fewer side effects, but still have some benefit to efficacy. Another one of these designer peptides is this one. Um, I'm not too sure it has a, a name other than it's Medimmunes um, 382. Uh, if we look along the bottom here at the structure of it, we can see that it's very similar to oxintamodulin, which actually activates both the GLP-1 and the glucagon receptors. But of course, by structuring your peptide appropriately, you can alter the affinities to which there is binding to the various receptors. And we know over a period of just a, a month and a half, we can see here a very considerable reduction in the glucose levels after a mixed meal compared with placebo, and also in that short period of time, a very considerable reduction in body weight. So another very interesting designer peptide. Maybe we can go from the dual agonist approach to the triple agonist approach. So for example, um, just down the road from here, some very interesting studies in which we see patients receiving an infusion for part of the day for a period of four weeks with GLP-1, oxintamodulin, which we've just seen, and PYY. Now, maybe I should have said in um, comment to the previous slide, why would you have glucagon in there if glucagon pushes glucoses up? But you can balance that off, of course, with another agent, for example, with something that stim uh, stimulates the GLP-1 receptor, uh, because you are then able to gain the other benefits of glucagon, for example, in its satiety effect, and also in enhancing energy expenditure. So here, we can see uh, the game plan of oxintamodulin, which will activate the glucagon receptor as well um, as the GLP-1 receptor, but we've got GLP-1 there in excess, of course, and we've also got PYY, and PYY is a strong satiety agent. So um, it's been given the nickname GOP. 
Let's see what happens then when you give all three. If we look here at the weight reduction over this fairly short period of time, and we compare our GOP, which showed a reduction in weight, against placebo, against what was achieved with Ruan Y bypass, which clearly wins here, and what was achieved with a very low calorie diet. That was the weight. But when you look at the reduction in that short period of time in glucoses, and it has to be a fructosamine in that short period of time, then the combination of those three peptides wins out compared with the Ruan Y and the very cal low calorie diet. And if you look at the change in fasting plasma glucose, you can also see that the combination of those three peptides does indeed achieve better than even the Ruan Y bypass. And we also see in that study a 32% reduction in food intake with this. We see a reduction in the average glucose profile uh, measured during the CGM and a reduction in the glucose excursion after a meal. So clearly, very interesting prospect for the future. Another one is the long-term um, administration of GLP-1s. In this case, it's exenatide with an osmotic mini-pump. This one's held up at the moment uh, because the FDA requires something doing associated with the device itself. I don't know what, but it works by taking in a little bit of uh, fluid here and pushing the piston and out comes the exenatide. It all sounds rather straightforward. It's inserted subcutaneously. It's about the size of a matchstick. And if we look at HbA1c changes comparing baseline here with, say, 48 weeks, the dark one, at these four different doses, we can see that all of them are able, over a period of a year, to achieve very good glycemic control. So clearly a lot of interest in this as a possibility for the future. There was also a large study on this done, the Freedom Study, but um, it's certainly there waiting to uh, get the final touches to its device. Um, if you didn't want to have an implant that required a bit of very, very, very minor surgery, you could, for example, have a depot injection. And this is an example showing how you could use a GLP-1 receptor agonist here in which you've got multiple copies of the molecule inserted within uh, an elastin-like uh, polypeptide which can be crumpled up within any form of gel, this might be a hydrogel, for example, which you could inject under the skin, uh, because as soon as it becomes warm, it nicely gels up. And just to have a look at what these multiple copies are made up of, so here you've got a GLP-1 analog, but it's got a small alteration here which stops it being broken down by DPP-4, We'll come back to why that's there in a minute. And it's got an arginine at this end, which enables that when you put the next copy of the peptide together here, you can see in here a glycine um, at the beginning that's been added on along with an alanine. So that glycine becomes next to that arginine, and that will break down, uh, as we can see here by... Uh, the presence of various proteases which break down the arginine glycine link, so it can just gently keep breaking down. And then the DPP4 in the circulation won't break down this crucial piece of the peptide, but it will break <coughs> off the linker that has been put in to enable these to be joined together. So it's a way of getting a very gentle release continuously of a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And I don't know how long this would last for in clinical studies because these were preclinical studies when the concept was looked at. 
So now let's have a quick look at the orals that might be coming available in the not too distant future. This one's already been mentioned, oral uh, semaglutide, and indeed it's uh, uh, just become approved as uh, we found out on the other side of the Atlantic. How does it work in terms of getting in? Well, it's actually taken in through the wall of the stomach. It's um, mixed in with a very large amount of an absorption enhancer, which is a, uh, a caprolate, uh, which actually um, raises the pH so that it's a little less acid around by the molecule itself, which enables it to be absorbed through the gastric mucosa. And if you just compare uh, the subcutaneous semaglutide here, which is the brown line, looking at the reduction in A1C, we can see that these various different doses of the oral will produce, certainly in the upper concentration, upper doses, very similar reductions in glucose levels, as indicated by the drop in A1C, and very similar levels in terms of weight loss to the subcutaneously administered semaglutide. So an interesting opportunity here for an oral peptide going in through the gastric mucosa. Now, it doesn't have to be a peptide. So we now have evidence that there are non-peptide GLP-1 receptor agonists, and I've picked on one here, which in uh, an early study has shown over a very short period of time that it is able to achieve reductions in A1C and body weight. So maybe we don't really need peptides in order to be able to fire this receptor. What about the sodium glucose transporter inhibitors? Well, um, this is what we have at the moment. So we're very familiar with DAPA, CAN, or EMPA. We've just got ER2. The next one down the, the line is likely to be um, sotagliflozin because this has just been approved in this part of the world for use as an adjunct to insulin in type 1 diabetes. And if we look at um, the ability to actually inhibit SGLT2, they're all much of a muchness, but you'll notice the difference here in their ability to do anything to SGLT1. So these with the big numbers require an awful lot to create any inhibition, so they don't have very much effect there. But you can see that CANA might have a bit of an effect to um, suppress SGLT1, and SOTA definitely an effect to suppress SGLT1, although as we will see, the concentration in the circulation is probably too low to be important. It's the effect in the gut. So in the gut, we have SGLT1, which enables our absorption of glucose into the circulation, and that glucose is normally filtered and reabsorbed almost entirely by SGLT2 and a little bit by SGLT1 in the kidney to get it back into the circulation, no glucosuria. But of course, if you are able to suppress the activity of SGLT1 in the intestine, then you would at least delay the uptake of glucose. And if, as we have with our SGLT2 inhibitors, a 20 to 30 percent reduction in the activity of SGLT2, that's how we get our substantial glucosuria. And that substantial glucosuria has now been shown to be uh, useful in various cases of uh, type 1 diabetes as an adjunct to insulin. I have to, at this point, stress it is not an alternative to insulin because the mechanisms are entirely independent of insulin, but you need insulin present. So this is a treatment to bring a glucose up here down to there. It's not to take a glucose that's there in order to be able to remove or drastically reduce the insulin. Maybe just a reduction in the bolus insulin. But nevertheless, you can see that it's there. And of course, by 
getting rid of calories, we're able to see weight loss, uh, we're able to see that small reduction in insulin dose, you get the blood pressure reduction as well. But don't take too much insulin away, or of course there is that risk of DKA, euglycemic as it is. But this is an insulin independent mechanism. Now, why would SGLT1 inhibition along with SGLT2 inhibition be useful? Well, if you just look here at the amount of glucose in the urine, when you take sotagliflozin and go from 200 milligrams to 400, either as twice 200, 400, you get very little change, in fact, no change worth talking about in the amount of glucose coming out in the urine. So there's probably nothing much happening to SGLT1 anymore in the kidney, but you still get, look, an additional reduction in A1C. So this would suggest there's probably something going on in the intestine. And what might be going on in the intestine is quite interesting. So here we'll take the uh, duodenal end, and there we will take the cecal end of the gut, and glucose would normally be uh, mostly in, uh, absorbed towards the more distal part of the jejunum. But, of course, glucose <coughs> passing into the ileum will fire GLP-1 and PYY from the L cells. Now, what happens when you inhibit uh, SGLT-1? Well, if you look at how sotagliflozin works, we can see that there's a high concentration in this early part of the jejunum. And of course, as the drug goes down here, some of it will be absorbed and some of it will be broken down. So by the time you get well through the jejunum, there isn't any sotagliflozin left. But it's inhibited quite a bit of the glucose uptake at this time. So you get much more uptake further down the gut. And as a result, you can get additional um, stimulation of GLP-1 and PYY, and we can see that on here. The green line shows the baseline, and then during the treatments you can see the higher GLP-1, the higher active GLP-1, and the higher PYY values. But of course we're down the bottom when it comes to SGLT-1 in the circulation not being affected. Um, another one that's interesting and being developed quite strongly in Japan at the moment is imeglimine. And here's its structure, and I just remind us that it's quite like metformin. I've drawn them out so you can see them in similar style here. And in fact, although it reduces hepatic gluconeogenesis and it increases peripheral glucose uptake, it probably also, to some extent, increases insulin secretion, but it does inhibit complex one in the respiratory chain in the same way as metformin, which is quite interesting. But there are differences in its mode of action because here we can see the reduction in A1C when you add it on to metformin, and you can also see the reduction here in A1C when you add it on to citagliptin. But it's an interesting agent which is being developed strongly in Japan. What about insulin? Will we be able to replace that? Here we can see um, an, a molecule that's not a peptide that was able to reduce glucoses in an insulin-resistant model, and in streptocytosis in diabetic mice, which don't have much insulin, it was very effective in the short term and in the long term in lowering glucose. And another possibility is an adiponectin receptor agonist, again, a non-peptide, an oral agent, which is able to improve glucose tolerance without increasing insulin levels and improving the hyporesponse to insulin. So this is another possibility. So, Chair, to conclude, we started off here trying to control glucose with all of these tissues being involved. And during the course of this lecture, we've been able to look at this agent to act there, a selection of those designer peptides acting in various ways, and new GLP-1 receptor agonists, the possibility of 
uh, small molecule insulin mimetics, adipokine agents, I mentioned just one at the end, adiponectin receptor agonists, and of course the SGLT1 and 2 um, inhibitors such as sotagliflozin. Um, if we'd had time, I could have added in all of these other agents, <laughs> which are also in development at this time. And if they all get approved, this is probably what that <laughs> therapies book will look like. Thank you very much. Thank you.